two of the machines, lunar mission. There had been a lunar mission one, remember that's the one that landed there, but it tipped over. And you can see why, because it's kind of a tall thing. It's actually 13 feet tall. I mean, it's got landing legs, but you can imagine if one of the legs crumples on landing, or if you just land on two inclined to the surface, you could tip over. So this is mission two. It's all part of the CLIPS program, which is commercial lunar payload services that NASA funds. And they do a lot of these kind of missions where they're paying for the transportation to get there. And then in this case, they also specified some of the things that are being done. Some of the things that are being done are financed by NASA. Some of them are not. It's a private mission. The company is free to sell whatever they want to do. They're landing close to the South Pole of the moon called the Shackleton Crater. It's actually an area near the Shackleton Crater. It uses the Nova Sea Lander, which is the same one as their last mission. It's been modified. In particular, they made the landing legs stronger. They also said that unlike last time, they're going to remember to flip the switch back on, which enables their laser rangefinder. That was the biggest single problem they had last time. They landed too fast because their rangefinder wasn't turned on. There was a manual override to protect people's eyes while it was back in the facilities where it was built. And they were pretty embarrassed about that. They would have done better if somebody had remembered in their procedures to flip the switch to turn back on the laser. This thing has a payload of about 286 pounds. It's not tiny. It's the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, 4,200 pounds. That's with fuel. That's so-called wet mass. Um, it's got solar panels, a couple hundred watts of that. And it is methane and oxygen fed, which is different than most of these landers have had. Usually because it's easy to do the hypergolic propellants, you can pretty much start them any time. This is a little more iffy, so they were taking a bit of a chance there. We had talked about this quite a bit in one of the previous news segments, so you can look back at that if you want some information. Now, the primary payload of this, called Prime-1, this is the NASA mission piece of it, they're looking for water ice. And they don't expect to find much on the surface. However, they're going to go down maybe a meter, uh, three feet or so, and they're going to drill for it. That is actually the drill I highlighted there with that little yellow arrow. What they'll do is they'll bring the samples back up, and then they have a mass spectrometer to do some analysis of it. This thing doesn't move. This is just a lander. If they get lucky, they might find something there. But wait, there's more. Inside that lunar lander, there's also a radiation monitor and also, Nokia is providing a 4G cellular network. Because if you're going to start putting a lot of stuff on the moon, they need to communicate. And apparently, even the 4G level communications are much faster, the data transfer, uh, much faster than they're getting with their, their current systems. And the other one is that they have a hopper. Now, the hopper doesn't mean with like a pogo stick. This is actually with rocket engines. They're little ones. You can see them underneath there. That big thing is, I think, a sensor, but the little rocket engines are down under here. Their goal is to find the ice in the permanently shadowed regions. Any water on the surface has probably been boiled off by the sun long ago. But there's a lot of shadowed craters, especially near the South Pole, because the sun is coming in at such an angle. Huge areas of shade where it's really, really cold, and ice could easily accumulate there. In fact, some of the ice that actually evaporates from the sun might have condensed inside of it. They think that mechanism could be applicable. So they're looking for that. And they have their own neutron spectrometer, which will allow them to look for hydrogen, which is a key indicator of water. And so it will jump in. It can go pretty far. Actually, it can carry a couple of pounds and go one and a half miles. And so they're saying, well, they'll jump into the Shackleton Crater. If they find a lava tube nearby, they'll try going into it. Whatever they find, they will try to explore as best they can. So it can get places that a normal rover couldn't get. And you'll get places that until you land, you're not going to have a chance to look for these small holes and the small craters and that sort of thing. It's about 30 inches tall. It's not tiny. Interesting to see how it works. But wait, there's more. We're not done yet. There's a rover in there, too. That one might be on the critical path. There was some concern that maybe that one wasn't going to be ready yet. But it's a mobile autonomous prospecting platform. Now, that's kind of a generic picture there on the right-hand side. The actual one that will be going there probably will look somewhat different. For instance, it has a roof, if nothing else. That's kind of the generic thing with various fixtures could be attached to it. So I'm sure what's actually going to look somewhat different than that. That's just their marketing literature. But what they're going to do, they can do some mapping, very detailed mapping. They're going to take samples. They're going to have a little digging thing of some sort. They can take 3D pictures. What's interesting is they're using a modified version of something out of Xbox. I guess it was cheap. And they will be part of the cellular network test. They'll go at least a mile away. This thing will go pretty far, apparently. And it weighs about 22 pounds. It's 18 inches long. Now, you probably also heard about this. It is part of the Artemis Accords. The whole idea is that 
No country can claim a piece of the moon or any planetary body. However, you can extract the resources. Well, not everybody agrees with that. People who have signed up for the Artemis Accords do agree with that. And this is kind of an attempt to just do a demonstration of a norm, try to establish a norm that it's going to be normal to extract resources and sell them. And so NASA's going to buy you know, a pile of regolith for a dollar. It's not clear how they're going to take delivery. I guess that'll have to be a future one of these, something like that. But it's really more establishing the principle. But wait, there's more. Inside that rover, you know, we already were talking about something that was inside the lander. Well, there's actually, on the roof of this lander, there's a little tiny garage. And there's, <laughs> there's an astro ant. One astro ant is going, what is that? Well, it's a miniature rover. It's got four wheels. It has very strong magnetic wheels. The idea is it can go up and around and so on. These things are the size of a matchbox. There's 16 in that picture there, but only one of them is actually going on this. It's rechargeable. In this little garage, apparently, it can be recharged. There was a question about this coming from the MIT Media Lab. They have a long history in artificial intelligence research. The MIT Media Lab has always been an interesting place. They do actually a lot of hardware stuff, like wearable computers and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that was just taken at their site. It's really a prototype just to demonstrate the principle. They're going to go over the roof and just measure temperatures. Now, it may not be that urgent of a need. You'd like to know there's a hot spot. But they're kind of demonstrating the point that their future vision is you're going to have robotic swarms that will be available. Doing inspections and diagnostics, that can be on any spacecraft, you know, on the moon or even in space. You know, when you're looking, say, for a micrometeorite hole and you've got a small pressure leak, you can't really have sensors, you know, every inch to try to figure out where things are to locate them. But you can have a swarm of robots kind of going all over and looking really, really carefully with different sensors. And so that's their vision. I mean, of course, it might scare you if those who remember the old Stargate series with the replicators. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, okay, this is the earliest stages. Don't worry about that. You know, <laughs> you know, it's actually addressing a real need. Is in general, you need some way to be able to inspect when problems occur, and this gives you one. Now, they're saying, you know, taking a little step further, at some point, they could be doing assembly and servicing as well. Obviously, these don't have that capability, but it's a start. So they're just sending one to test it out cheaply. And wait, there's more. Now, this is taking a step back. The rocket that's taking this thing to the moon, it has plenty of spare capacity. Uh, the last flight, last time they did this, they actually returned to the launch site, which takes more fuel. They've actually got several secondary payloads on this thing. One is a lunar communication satellite, which I think is partially relaying some of the signals back for this mission. A separate thing called the Lunar Trailblazer. This is a lunar orbiter. This is actually a NASA project as well. It is going to do some detection and mapping of water and minerals on the lunar surface and also looking for future landing spots. And it's pretty good size. This is 460 pounds. It's not a little CubeSat kind of a thing. I mean, this is a significant thing. And that's not all. There's also a spacecraft called Odin that's going to go off and survey an asteroid, you know, do a little prospecting on an asteroid. That's purely a private mission. Astroforge is a company, their business is they see an opportunity for extracting platinum group metals from near-Earth asteroids. It's actually not that expensive to get to a near-Earth asteroid. It's actually not really necessarily much worse than going to the moon. So they're looking for those, and they picked one that they think has a pretty high probability of having recoverable metal in it, and they've kept it a secret. They're not revealing yet which one it is. They're afraid of competition, I guess. But as a result, they are the first commercial entity that has now gotten a deep space license, and that's from the FCC for communications purposes. And so there's a lot of these private mission kind of things that are creeping in more and more, and getting licenses to show for it. It's kind of interesting. Uh, this thing weighs about 220 pounds. They had kind of a checkered history. They were trying to demonstrate how they were going to do this refining of metals in space, and that they had some kind of problem with that craft. And then they built another one, and they outsourced some of the construction of it to some company that it basically had big cracks and wasn't working either. They finally just broke down and built their own. So they're kind of behind their original schedule, but this is now all their own stuff. Could be interesting to see how this goes. They see a market for bringing back small quantities of high-value metal actually back to Earth. That's their business. Okay. Other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a list of videos at my YouTube channel, so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions.
You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.